Philippians chapter 1. It's a, it's a chapter well worth rereading. I would like to encourage you to do something. When we reach the end of each chapter in Philippians, because we're trying to take this at a very slow pace, I would encourage you in that following week uh, to just take a moment and reread that chapter and just reflect on the richness that we've received Sunday after Sunday as we walk through just a few verses at a time and, and, and keep the, the whole scope of the book in front of you. This is a rich book. It is a powerful book because it is God's Word. And this section we're going to read this morning uh, has great potential to transform our perspective. This week, next month, next year about our own lives and the lives of our brothers and sisters around the world. Let's read it with that anticipation. We're going to read the entirety of verses 27 through 30, but we're going to be zeroing in on that second half uh, that we didn't cover two weeks ago, the second half of this paragraph, uh, verses 29 and 30. Let's begin reading Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Lord, bless the preaching of your word. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, the Sunday before Easter, that you can sort of break down this paragraph into three sections. Paul begins with this overarching call. You notice there in verse 27, he says, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Paul puts that banner over the life of the Christian. To live worthy or to reflect on or on the gospel that has saved you is Paul's overarching exhortation. The rest of the letter is going to fill in and apply what that means. His call for Christ begins verse 27. But, but then he begins to talk about our courage for Christ. That first thing that comes to Paul's mind when he talks about our call for Christ is standing firmly for Christ in the face of opposition that would desire to lead us away from those convictions. That would try to make Christ look uh, like something we should be embarrassed by or ashamed of or silent about. And he says, no, don't be afraid of anything. Stand courageously, united together for Christ. And then in order to help them understand and have the right perspective of the pain that is often attached to living worthy of the gospel, he gives them a perspective of suffering in verse 29 and 30. And that's the part we'll zero in on this morning. So the overall section is our, our call in Christ, our courage for Christ, and then finally 29 and 30, our suffering for Christ. So we're going to look at our suffering for Christ this morning. The suffering that comes about, not just because a Christian is generally in a broken world, but specifically because they are standing for the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1895, the American author Stephen Crane published a novel about a young soldier in the Civil War. Now, I've, I've never read Crane's novel. I'm sure some of you have. And so if I get something wrong here, you come and let me know later. But I'm not going to try to attempt too much of an examination, so I should be safe. I've never read the novel, but I've always loved the title. It's called The Red Badge of Courage. Such a clever title. The Red Badge of Courage. In the book, the young soldier flees a battle out of fear. He's convinced that his regiment is about to be annihilated. But then when he makes it all the way back uh, to the station where the generals are, he finds out that, in fact, his regiment stood firm. And he fled out of cowardice. He abandoned his post. 
realizing that the worst thing has happened. He has fled and cowardly stamp has been placed upon him in his own mind. He longs for a wound that will prove his courage, a wound that will be evidence that he does have courage, that he has stood in battle. As the book progresses, uh, the man eventually does stand courageously, carries his flag forward in a charge towards the enemy. But the idea of a red badge of courage is this idea that the only way he can prove without a doubt that he is standing courageously for his regiment, for his cause, is to have this red badge, this wound. Suffering is the evidence, it's the proof of his stand. I think that is precisely what Paul is after here. He's wanting them to have a right perspective of suffering. He's very aware that it's painful. He's very aware that it's difficult. He's aware that when you stand for Jesus in little ways or big ways, and it costs you something, it is painful. Paul is not some kind of stoic. He's not a man who walks around thinking, just ignore the pain. It's not that bad. No, Paul would say, it is that bad, but let me give you the right perspective. Let me help you understand the right way to think about your pain. It is a badge, Paul might say. It is an honor. It is, we might even say, a gift. For Paul, suffering for Christ is an honor that gives evidence of our salvation in Christ. Suffering for Christ is an honor, and it's an honor that does something for us. It gives evidence of our salvation in Christ. It proves that our life is worthy of the gospel that has saved us and is headed towards a salvation to be revealed in the end. Suffering for Christ is an honor, according to Paul. And so he wants to import this way of thinking through these final two verses, 29 and 30. Now we're going to break down these two verses into two points. The gift of suffering and the fellowship of suffering. The gift of suffering and the fellowship of suffering. And both are designed to help the Philippians and us have a radically different view of suffering for Christ than we naturally would. A radically different view. To see it as a red badge of courage for Christ, as opposed to just painful and to be avoided. He begins by talking about the gift of suffering. Look down there at verse 29. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. I want to zero in on this word granted to start us off here. This word granted has a relationship with the word grace in the original Greek. It has the idea of a king being benevolent towards one of his subjects. He has granted them something. And the whole sense of the word is that it is a, a good thing. It is out of his love and affection and magnanimity toward this subject. He wants to grant them something. He has granted them a privilege. This is not a punishment. This is not a, a curse. This is not a discipline. This is a granting. It is a gift, we might even say. It is the gift of suffering for Christ. Now, that is highly unusual. Highly unusual for us to think of it that way. And actually, Paul wants them to be so aware of the gift of suffering that he actually interrupts himself. Paul's always doing that. And he begins by saying, it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should first believe in him, but also, and I think this is his main accent, suffer for his sake. So he begins with something that we understand. It is a gift of the Lord that we should believe in him. Now, we all understand that as Christians. We understand that the ability to believe in Jesus, the ability to have faith in Christ, is not something we earned by our good works. It's not something we deserve because we were better than our neighbor. It's not something we, we strived to achieve. We didn't work our way through college so we can finally be worthy of believing in Christ. No, it is something that God gave to countless enemies as an undeserved gift. It has been granted to you, Paul says, 
that you should believe in Christ. Very, very important that we, we feel Paul's astonishment because it's going to flow into his thinking about suffering. Paul always views salvation as an incredible gift. He always views it as an amazing gift, a granting by a sovereign God who had no need to grant this privilege. He, he, God looks out at the world, according to Paul. He sees a host of enemies who hate him, people who go their own way, who seek their, their own passions and interests, who love themselves more than they love God, who could care less about their creator. And he says, this God, surprising, you know what he does? I, I'd like to grant something to people in this sinful creation. If you have children, you can, you can understand how unusual this is. Have you ever had an experience, if, if you've had children, you, 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 at some point, most of you, I think, were a child, um, and you grew up, um, and, and there was a moment when all of the children were just behaving horribly. It's like everything that's been trained in them was forgotten that morning. They woke up without any of their former training. There's no obedience. There's no self-control. There's damage being done. Things are being broken. Screaming is taking place. Injuries are being handed out by fellow siblings and so forth. It's like, what has happened to you over the night? That's, that's the world God looks down on. And God says, I'd like to bless you. I'd like to give you disobedient, rebellious, destructive people the greatest blessing I can give you, the ability to see the glory of Jesus dying in your place for your sins and bringing you into a closer relationship with me. That's what Paul says has been granted. It's been granted to you. But Paul thinks of salvation as a a favorite ring that should be worn prominently on the finger. It should be displayed proudly. It has been granted to you, gifted to you. He says in Ephesians that salvation is a gift of God's grace. And he begins here to remind them that to be a Christian is the most unspeakable privilege. It is the greatest joy because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name and your hard heart has been made alive and your future has been secured. And listen, if you're here and you're listening to this sermon and you're not sure if you're a Christian or not, let me encourage you to receive the gift that God offers. And you may sense in your heart a desire to receive that gift. That is the Lord doing that work in your soul. Let me encourage you, if you're here, maybe you grew up in the church and you're not so sure about Christianity. It seems like a lot of rules. Wrong. Christianity is primarily and foundationally a gift of God to an undeserving people. It's God saying, come and let me forgive your sins and let me give you the ability to see Jesus as a savior and to have a future and a hope. And let me appeal to you. If you're a young child or if you're here visiting or you don't know Jesus, receive the gift of salvation that God grants to those who he has called to him himself. Paul's always wanting to get believers into a gospel-centric mood so that they can understand his teaching about the rest of life. If you don't understand the gift of salvation, you're definitely not going to understand the gift of suffering. If you don't appreciate the, the, the mercy of belief in Christ, then you're never going to have the right perspective about suffering. Actually, it's often the case that when we are angry or upset or complaining about suffering, you can trace that back to a forgetfulness about the gift of the gospel. When we are angry or upset or, or frustrated or worried about suffering, it's often the case that you can trace that back to a forgetfulness that it has been granted to you to believe in Jesus. That was not your own doing. It was the gift of God, not by your works, so that you cannot boast. You can only be grateful. It has been granted to you, Paul says, to believe in Christ, but not only that. I'm assuming you're remembering that since I just talked about it over the last chapter. I'm assuming you remember that gift, but that is not the only gift that has been given to you. Not only belief, as incredible a gift as that is, but to suffer for his sake. 
Now we see how this comes together. If you don't understand the incredible gift of salvation in Christ, suffering for Christ will not seem like a gift. If you do understand that Christ has saved you by an infinite cost, then suffering out of loyalty to him becomes an honor and a privilege. Does it not? Why would you want to suffer for someone you don't care about? Why wouldn't you want to suffer for someone you love more than anything? That's Paul's logic. He's saying we're called to suffer for Christ. I want want you to notice that that in Paul's mind, suffering is a gift. And I think there's two significant reasons for this. The first is that we are suffering for a person. We are suffering for Christ. Notice here, it is for. I want to to point out two fours here. I'm going to do it in, in reverse order. It has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. For the sake of Christ, for his sake. The first thing that makes suffering a gift is the person we are suffering for. This this kind of suffering, again, it's not speaking to general difficulty in the world, uh, general pain because of sickness. There's many passages that speak to that. This is talking about that suffering that we experience because we are Christians and because we are seeking to live lives worthy of the gospel. And I don't think it just is talking about the kind of martyrdom that takes place when a person says, I believe in Jesus in the face of the threat of death. I think it's also talking about any moments that through our obedience to Christ and his word, we experience the difficulty of a world that hates Jesus. It's any moment that through our faithfulness to Christ and his word, we experience the opposition of a world that hates Jesus. That is suffering for Christ. That is living worthy of the gospel. Suffering is a gift because there is no more precious person than Jesus Christ. There's no more glorious person. There's no more valuable person. There's no more person that has done more to rescue you. And no one has suffered more than Jesus Christ. Our suffering is a, a tiny fractional reflection of what Jesus did to save us. If we use a human example, you could imagine, for example, a... Let's say a a police officer gives his life to save someone in the community and dies on their behalf. And let's say that person in the community finds out that that officer has a child. And out of love for that officer, this person wants to sacrifice to help that child. And so he provides for some of their needs, and he, he provides gifts at the holidays, and he looks for ways to, to improve and better their life and, and, and looks out for them in moments when, they're, when their reputation is in danger out of love for the one that gave his life for them. Now, that, that breaks down because Jesus didn't just die for us. He faced the wrath of God for us. But the logic is the same. No sacrifice is too great for the one who sacrificed himself to purchase our eternity. Suffering is a gift because it gives you the privilege of suffering for the one who died for you. There is a suffering necessary for God's purposes in Christ to be fulfilled that is still incomplete. Not the atoning suffering, that's Christ and Christ alone, but the suffering of witness, the suffering of loyalty, the suffering of the church while God's message is being proclaimed in this world. The church has to exist in this world, and they have to stand up for Christ. And so in God's divine providence, there is a suffering still to be fulfilled. So we have this this privilege. You get the chance to suffer for the one who suffered for you. You get the, in God's mind, unspeakable privilege to experience some small pain for the one who agonized for you. You get the honor of wearing the badge of sufferer for Christ, Paul says to the Philippians. 
a sufferer for Christ badge. And there is no greater badge of honor for the Christian who has stood at the foot of the cross and listened to that one saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And it is finished. For that Christian to wear the badge of, I experienced pain because of my loyalty to him. That There is no greater badge of honor. That is the red badge of courage, according to the Bible. Suffering is a gift because of who we get to suffer for. Paul views a Christian who's standing at the foot of the cross to view Christ as much more valuable, infinitely more valuable than their own comfort. The world views their own comfort as more valuable than Christ. The person who has seen Christ on the cross reverses those values and sees Christ as infinitely more value than their own comfort. They'd rather be uncomfortable than see Christ dishonored. They'd rather be in pain than miss an opportunity to honor Christ. Now, very, very important caveat here. Paul is not a masochist. He doesn't believe in pain for its own sake. He doesn't believe Christians should go out and hurt themselves or even do the hardest thing just because it's the hardest thing. Now, that's, that's not what he's speaking to here. He's saying that when God gives and grants an opportunity for you through your normal Honoring of Christ to experience suffering, you should count that as a gift. You're not like some of those misguided monks in the Middle Ages that whipped themselves to prove that they were worthy of Christ or that they could pay for their sins. No, this is in the, in the ordinary callings of life, in evangelism, in standing in our convictions, in believing God's word and not being afraid of, of, of saying that we represent the Bible of being holy in an unholy world. These are the ways that we stand for Christ, and in that normal standing for Christ, we will sometimes suffer. Paul says it's a gift because of who you are suffering for. It's also a gift, second reason, because it gives evidence of our future salvation in Christ. I want to look back at that first four. Very important, important four. Notice... Verse 29 begins with four. It has been granted to you, there's the gift language, that for the sake of Christ, there's the person language, you should not only believe in him but suffer in his sake. The first four in verse 29, it points back, I think, to this idea that your courage in the face of suffering is an evidence of your future salvation. You see that in the text? Looks down there. It says, this is a clear sign to them of their destruction, that they're fighting against the army of Christ but of your salvation. The, the willingness to suffer for Christ reveals your future because you only suffer for something you value and you only value Christ if you are going to be saved ultimately by him. This is the idea that, that the reason that this is a, a gift for the reason that your, your future salvation is evidenced by your courage is that God has given you the gift of the test of suffering. And that test demonstrates something in you that indicates your future salvation. It has been granted to you to have the painful test that reveals your love for Christ and your worthiness of the gospel, which is in itself an indication that you will finally be saved by Christ. Your pain and your courage through your pain points to your future. It's a gift because of who you suffer for and how your suffering reveals your future in him. Let me read just a couple of other verses that speak a, a similar point. John, the Gospel of John 15, 18 through 20 says, If the world hates you, this is Jesus speaking, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Or 1 Peter 1, 3-7, Blessed be the God and Father 
of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Listen to this. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That is objectively true of them objectively true of them, but Peter doesn't stop there. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that for, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul seems to be saying the very choice that God has made to test you is in itself a reason that your salvation is being proven through your courage for Christ. God has gifted you this because he wants to reveal in this age those who will be in Christ in the coming age. Those who belong to Jesus will suffer. The disciple is not above his master. If we would follow the one who died on the cross, we must take up our cross and follow him. If the world hated him, they will hate us also. Put simply, suffering for Christ in some way is necessary to reveal that we actually belong to him. And doing that is a gift of God. So, where can we view suffering with courage as a gift, as a gracious opportunity of the Lord. Well, anywhere that humble obedience to Christ and loyalty to his gospel would lead to sacrifice. Where would courageous loyalty to Christ lead to sacrifice? That is a gift of the Lord to you. It's possible that this could take place in our evangelism, where we speak to those in this pluralistic society that wants to say everything is equally valuable and say, no, there is one way that leads to salvation. And we reap the condemnation of a world that hates proselytizing because it dares to claim that one way is better than all the others. A recent Barna poll, uh, not too long ago, I guess, said that 47% of millennial evangelicals believe, believe that evangelism is wrong. Now, I don't know how they define evangelical, so I wouldn't be too scared about that, but 47% of somewhat professing Christians believe, millennials believe, evangelism is wrong. Well, it's not hard to see why. If you've grown up in a world where you're told and lullabied that your own heart is trustworthy and you can be true to yourself and be real, it's not difficult to see why someone else telling you that there is only one way and that you should convert to that one way if you want to be saved would be viewed negatively. So what does it mean to say to a person who wants to believe everything, you have to believe one thing? It means suffering for Christ. What about the athlete who says they can't play on a Sunday, whether they're 14 years old or 40 years old? Because in this particular moment of their life, that's the only time they can gather with the church. And they face the anger of their coach and the mockery of their teammates. What about the family member who insists that abortion is sinful and refuses to recommend that a woman in a difficult situation is right to kill her child, even when that seems atrociously insensitive to the culture? What about you? The question of sexual godliness comes up, and you are forced to declare a certain pattern of life sinful because you are willing to stand for Christ and his word. And it leads to the mockery and scorn of a culture which is actively fighting against Christ. And you suffer. Paul would say, gift. Badge of honor. Evidence. Revealing that God wants to reveal your future in Christ. 
What can you take with you into that moment? Into that small interpersonal moment, into that moment online, into that big moment when you might lose your job because you can no longer countenance what is taking place in the exaltation of anti-Christ agendas. Gift. For Christ. Evidence of your future inheritance in Christ. A sign, received or unreceived, of their destruction, which will ultimately vindicate God when you are courageously enduring suffering as an opportunity from God rather than as punishment from God. There is an honor in standing for Christ. Whether we are suffering in profound ways or in just simple difficulties, in most suffering, there is also another temptation which weakens our courage, another temptation which can sometimes pull Christians away from faithfulness. Here's what it is. I am unique. I am unique. No one else suffers the way I suffer. No one else has to deal with what I have to deal with. And Paul, as he brilliantly does, answers that objection immediately. The first thing he says is that suffering is a gift. It's granted. It's a privilege from the Lord that loves you and wants to reveal his purposes in you. But the second thing he says is that there is a fellowship of suffering. So you can speak back to that tempting voice that says, I am unique. My stand for Christ has caused me to suffer in ways no one else has. I have a unique cocktail of suffering, and it's not fair, and I shouldn't have to face it. And Paul says to the Philippians, no. No, there is a fellowship of suffering. There's a gift of suffering, but there's also a fellowship of suffering. Notice what he says. You are suffering for his sake, engaged, verse 30, in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. You're engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Paul brings his own example right up to that objection and stomps it down to the ground. He comes up to this Philippian sister who might be saying, I can't believe we have to suffer in this way. He says, remember, remember, you saw that the same conflict you're in, I also was in. You may remember that when I preached the gospel to you at first, I was beaten and then put in prison unjustly, without a trial, without any kind of due process, without any kind of rights as a Roman citizen. I was put in jail. Remember when I was in that jail singing to the Lord? I was in the same conflict you're in right now. And you'll also remember that I'm writing this letter from prison because I've been falsely accused and my enemies have gotten Rome to, take, uh, to, to capture me and cart me off to Rome, and, and I'm, I'm still fighting the same conflict. He, he brings his own example right up to that objection. I am unique. I suffer more than everybody. Nobody deals with what I have to deal with. And he says, no, remember me in the prison. Brothers and sisters, remember me in my chains. Remember the, the bruises that you saw on me. Remember how unfairly I was treated. Remember, and remember, even now, even now, years later, I'm, here I am again. I'm still in prison. I'm still fighting for the gospel of Jesus Christ and suffering for his sake. I'm still waging warfare. The word conflict there, it has to do with athletic wrestling. It's this idea of, of exerting all of your strength and might towards a particular cause. He's saying you're engaged in that same battle, that same struggle, the wrestling for the gospel of Jesus Christ, for loyalty to Christ, and you are not alone in this. I'm right here with you. You're not standing alone in this battle. Brothers and sisters are with you both in this age and through the centuries. There's something about a fellowship in suffering that makes suffering easier. Isn't that true? Haven't you ever had someone come up to you and say, I know exactly what you're feeling. 
let me tell you what happened to me. There's something about knowing you're, you're not alone that brings real joy. Now, now self-pity is like a drug. Self-pity says to you, you're going to feel better if you just talk about how unique you are. But you know and I know that experience, it, it has this half-life and ev eventually it fades and you don't actually become happy. You just keep telling yourself, I'm unique, I'm unique, I'm unique. Nobody suffers like this. Nobody suffers. I'm sure I'll be happier if I just keep saying this over and over and over again. And it'll make me feel so good. I am privileged with a unique suffering. That sense of unique privilege will make up for all of my pain. But it never works. It never works. Real joy comes in knowing we're, we're in this together. Through the centuries and across the countries, we're, we're in this together. We're engaged in this gospel-centric warfare together. We don't use physical weapons. We use words of proclamation. We don't use hatred. We use love. We don't use battles. We use servanthood. We, we use the weapons of the Spirit. We, we use these weapons, and we are engaged in a fellowship of suffering. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying, you are engaged in the same conflict that I am engaged in. Listen, the first thing that ennobles suffering is knowing you're doing it for Christ and the evidence of your salvation. But it also ennobles our suffering to know we are just standing with people like Paul. Now, do I think anybody in the Philippian church suffered as much as Paul? No. If anybody had the right to say they were unique, it was Paul. But Paul gladly links arms with them. He says, look, when you face your small moment of suffering, you are with me, sister. You are with me, brother. We can almost imagine Paul in the spirit coming up next to that Philippian sister who has to face this difficult choice to stand for Christ and saying, I am with you. We are in this conflict together. You can see him going up to that brother who, who might face persecution for standing against the, the demonic exor, exorcisms in the, in the, and he's trying to speak against demonic activity rather in, in this community and, and he faces suffering and anger the way Paul does and Paul's saying, I've been there before. I am with you, brother. We are in the same conflict. You can see him coming up to you and saying, I, I am with you. As you prioritize Christ and the work of the gospel, I am for you. We are engaged in the same conflict. This is an honor to be a part of this cause together. To choose not to stand for Christ is to step away from the honorable company of Christian soldiers who have battled for him through the ages. It's to keep your distance from Paul and Peter and John and Augustine and Luther and Calvin and Adoniram Judson and William Carey and Jonathan Edwards and Jim Elliot and Nate Saint and countless other saints who could say with Paul, we are engaged in the same conflict. Paul wants to motivate them to see the badge of honor, the regimental badge of honor for those who suffer in the conflict of the gospel against the powers of this world. William Shakespeare wrote the play Henry V and towards the climactic moment there's a speech that you've probably heard referenced where they're standing looking at the battlefield and his cousin, the king's cousin, Westmoreland, is, is a little disappointed. And he, he, he's, he's looking at the, the army they're facing and he's thinking of all those soldiers that are back at home. And he says, oh, if only there was 10,000 Englishmen that are now sleeping in their beds here with us on this battle. If only there were more. Here we are alone. Henry responds with a long speech designed to help him understand 
the honor of standing on that battlefield. Small though their number may be, it will be an honor to be in that company. He says this, from this day to the ending of the world, we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be he never so vile. This day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves accursed that they were not here and hold their manhoods cheap while any speak that fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day. That's what Paul's trying to breathe into the hearts of these Philippians. The band of the church standing for Christ, facing opposition, painful, subtle, atrocious, and violent, stands together, engaged in a conflict of proclamation and self-control and godliness for the glory of the Lord, fighting fights in homes and in the public square, declaring for Christ in the face of shame on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, standing for him when it will mean a loss that is painful and standing together with all those through the centuries and in the present who are likewise suffering for him and declaring, this is my badge of honor. This is my laurel wreath. This is my crown. To stand loyally for Christ, not afraid of anything in my opponents, not fearful of cultural backlash, not fearful of positional demotion, not fearful of anything because it is a gift of God to be given the badge of honor that is suffering for Christ. Paul wants to Breathe that honor into the Philippians. And God wants to breathe that honor into you. Throw out comfort as a cheap trinket of this world when you have the chance to receive the badge of suffering for Christ. Comfort is temporary. That badge is eternal. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to ask for your grace. Lord, in little decisions of priorities and big decisions of witness, we pray, Lord, that you would give us courage to stand for you. Lord, reveal in our hearts anywhere that we are clinging to comfort as an idol and cause us to see suffering for you as a gift. Any sacrifice, Lord, any sacrifice in the path of obedience, let us see it as a gift. Lord, please, I, I pray that you would impart that into the hearts of men and women, yes. teens, boys and girls right now, Lord, that any way that they can stand for you and it costs them something is a badge of honor. Impart that right now into our church. Let us live worthy of the gospel that has saved us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.